Hey, what's up guys? My name is Ashona. Welcome back to this batch rendering mini series. So last time we took a look at how we could get textures into our batch. Definitely check out that video if you haven't already. And today we're gonna to be talking all about dynamic batching. So up until now, we've had our entire batch, our vertex buffer kind of defined up front. All of the data that's been in it, we've defined at the beginning of our application. And all we've done every frame is just simply rendered it. We've referenced that existing data that we've already sent to the GPU and then just told it to be rendered. We've commanded it to be rendered via a draw call. Now that's great because there are heaps of scenarios in games where we just have like this kind of static geometry blob and we just wanna keep rendering that. We don't really care about being able to control it. But there are also a lot of cases in which that's just not gonna cut it. We actually need to be able to frame to frame set the positions of all these different quads that we've grouped together into one draw call into one batch dynamically. And that is what today's video is about. But first I wanna thank Skillshare for sponsoring this video. So for those of you who don't know, Skillshare is an online learning community for creatives where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey. Skillshare offers thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people on topics including illustration, design, photography, video, freelancing, and more. I think that pretty much all of you watching this video right now, you're people who really wanna learn more and that's exactly what Skillshare lets you do. And I love the fact that Skillshare's videos are typically so short. I mean, mine can go on for quite a while and not saying that's bad, but sometimes you just wanna pick up a new skill without having to watch really long videos and spend too much of your time actually learning that because let's be honest, I mean, who has tons of time lying around? As people watching these videos on graphics programming, it's really important that apart from just programming, you have more of a creative eye and you're aware of like design and illustration and all of this kind of creative stuff that ties these graphics together. If you're just kind of boiled down into that code and that's, that's all you care about, you're just in the code, you're not gonna make anything pretty. For example, I really like these creative illustration classes. And in fact, this class is great for helping you to design a logo. Make 2020 a year in which you explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity with Skillshare's online classes. And with an annual subscription of less than $10 a month, it's a really good way to actually do all of that. But of course, Skillshare being the lovely company that they are, are offering the first 500 of you that sign up using the link in the description below two whole months of free Skillshare Premium. So make sure you jump on that link as soon as possible and start learning all of those new skills. Let me know what kind of skills you guys end up learning as well. There's so much on that platform. I haven't explored it all yet. Definitely check it out. And of course, as always, thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Okay, let's talk about dynamic batch rendering. So there are a few moving parts when it comes to making your batch rendering dynamic. In fact, there's two kind of main parts and that's the vertex buffer and the index buffer. So today we're gonna focus specifically on that vertex buffer. As we've seen so far in this series, when our program first starts up, that's when we create this kind of vertex buffer. But what if we didn't have to predefine all of those vertices right then and there during our initialization code? What if we could somehow move that responsibility and make it something that we can actually do every frame, data that we can set every frame. That would mean that we could dynamically respond to, for example, the position of a quad or something like that, or the size of a quad, or if this quad even has to be rendered or not. It would give us tremendous power, really. And the good news, of course, is that we can do that, and it's actually pretty simple. All we really have to do is mark our vertex buffer as dynamic. That means that we can actually set the data inside that vertex buffer whenever we like. We can just simply copy bytes of memory into that vertex buffer at some kind of location. There are a few different steps involved in this, but just to quickly summarize what it is we're gonna do here when we jump into the code, we're basically going to take the function that we use to actually set the data and use it only to allocate an actual buffer on our GPU that is large enough to hold all of our vertices. We're not gonna set any data at all. And then later on in the actual rendering code, just before we render, we're gonna come in and we're going to copy all of that data from our CPU, all of the vertex data that we have there, into OpenGL, into our GPU, so that we can then access it and render it as normal. So it's a very simple move when you think about it. We're just literally taking that block of vertices and moving them to be in that kind of rendering function that we're using that gets called every frame. But of course, by doing so, we make it dynamic because we can now calculate that data or respond to anything really to determine what the data should be and then upload it then and there without having to worry about any kind of predefined data 
whatsoever. Anyway, it's gonna be a lot easier to actually understand when you see the code and when I walk you through it. So let's dive in and take a look. So this is all the code from last time. And if I launch this, we got this result. We just kind of had these two quads being rendered here with separate textures all batched together into one draw call. And now what I wanna do is take you guys through what it takes to make this all dynamic. So as I mentioned, it's currently static in the sense that everything that we define for this particular batch for this vertex buffer, it's all done like in this on attach function. It's all kind of set in stone to be a certain value and that's it. When we come over here into on update, all we're doing here is essentially binding the textures, then binding the vertex array and just issuing that draw as well. Now there are some things we can still customize. Like for example, these uniforms here, we can change the camera, we can change the transform of the entire batch. And we can also bind any two textures we want. So the fact that those two are currently the Cherno logo and the Hazel logo, there's nothing to stop us from flipping them or introducing another texture. We can do all of that, that's all fine. But what we can't do is change the position of one of the quads, for example, or change the size of it or do anything like that whatsoever because this vertex data is in fact already inside the vertex buffer and that vertex buffer is essentially set in stone. So what we're gonna do is just change all of that completely so that every frame we actually create this vertex buffer data. And there are a few ways to actually achieve something like this. So I'm just gonna show you one of the ways, the ways that I like doing it, but just keep that in mind. The idea here and the thing to really take home here is that you can dynamically change the contents of your vertex buffer. And that is how you achieve this dynamic kind of rendering. Okay, cool, let's begin. So the first thing that I'm really gonna do is not worry about these vertices. I mean, they're set up pretty well here, but I'm just going to pretend that they don't exist. I'm gonna just comment them out. The reason being that even though we could start with these vertices, we're probably going to want to dynamically set them every frame. So this data will eventually move into the on update function. What I'll do is I'll come down here into GL buffer data. This is the important kind of function that we call here because what this does is, well, it actually does a, a few things. Apart from just simply setting these vertices and actually sending them to our GPU and storing them in GPU memory, it also actually allocates the buffer on our GPU that will hold all of this data. And this is really important to note because what we can actually do is basically change how we use this function completely. Instead of actually using it to set data, we can just use it as an allocation function. And the way that we do that is instead of supplying it with a pointer to a buffer, which is what we're doing here, we're giving it th that vertices pointer, which is a float array, which is a float pointer. Instead of doing that, we can simply give it null pointer, which means we're not supplying it with any data. So then the usefulness of this function falls into this parameter, which is how much data do we wanna allocate in bytes? And this is how we're going to use this function. What we're gonna do is we're gonna just allocate a maximum size for our vertex buffer. And then every frame, we're gonna kind of populate that vertex buffer with certain data and keep track of how much data we've actually populated it with. So what we need to do now is decide how many vertices essentially we can store inside our vertex buffer. Of course, arbitrarily typing in a number like 1024, meaning a kilobyte of memory, that's not really that useful because obviously this is a vertex buffer and we want to kind of, the units that we want to use for this are vertices because we can't have half a vertex, that's useless. So what we wanna do is figure out just how big one vertex is. Now at the moment, everything is just a bunch of floats, which is kind of annoying. It's not really a really nice way of doing things at all. Because just by looking at this, it's actually really hard to tell just by reading it that these three, are the position, these four are the color, these two are the texture coordinate, and this is the texture ID. That kind of makes no sense. So what we would probably want to do instead is create a struct called vertex. And inside this struct, we're going to basically have the structure of each vertex. So what we'll do is we'll have three floats for the position, which I'll write like this. Then we'll have four floats for the color. Then we'll have the two texture coordinates. So I'll call this text chords two. And finally, we'll have a text ID as well. Okay, so now we have a complete vertex that basically replaces all of this and we can actually set these up much easier now. If we wanna create a new vertex, we can do something like this and then set, for example, the position equal to whatever the position should be without actually having to just basically 
have this huge row of floats, which could be interpreted anyway. Okay, cool. So now that we've got that, let's decide how many vertices we want. Well, just for this example, let's just say we want 1000 vertices. So what we'll need to do is say size of vertex times 1000. So we've basically created a vertex buffer that is capable of storing 1000 of these vertices. That is how much memory we've allocated. We don't have to store exactly 1000 or anything like that. That's just the size. That's the, that's the entire capacity of our vertex buffer. We can't exceed that, but we can definitely say that, you know, in this case, for example, we only need eight vertices. So we can absolutely just store eight in there if we want. And now finally, this parameter is really important. At the moment, it's set to static draw. What this is, is a little bit of a hint to OpenGL to how we're going to actually use this memory. So static draw means that we've, we've kind of defined everything statically up front and that we wanna use it for drawing. So really what this is saying is it's going to act as read-only memory. We're not exactly going to write to it. However, we want to write to it every frame. So what we need to do is change this to read GL dynamic draw. So what this means is that we're going to dynamically be populating the vertex buffer. And of course, we're still gonna be using it for drawing. If you're still unsure as to what this actually means, then definitely consult the OpenGL documentation, which will define it more formally. Okay, cool. Down here, this remains exactly the same, except instead of having this 10 times float here, which is what basically one vertex is, it's 10 floats, we can simply write size of vertex, which is just gonna kind of clear it up. So I'll kind of just apply that to all of these. And finally, another kind of code clarity thing you can do here is just use the offset of function here. Well, it's actually a macro that lets you figure out the byte offset of any member. So in other words, we can use this to actually get the correct offset in bytes of each one of these struct members, which are of course our vertex attributes. So I'll copy and paste this into all of these ones. So we have color, then we have text coords, then we have text ID. And I'll even do this for the first one, just in case we decide to rearrange our struct, because that means that this will always work. Because of course, if we do rearrange this, then the offset will also be rearranged here. Okay, cool. So this is looking a little bit more clear now, a little bit easier to read. None of this changes. Let's take a look at our index buffer. So what changes with our index buffer? Well, that's kind of the beauty of this, nothing. The index buffer really shouldn't change because what we're gonna be doing is just setting this data dynamically. But the fact that to draw a quad, we need to draw index zero, one, two, and then two, three, zero, that's not gonna change. It's just gonna keep going in this pattern for as many quads as we decide to draw. So in other words, what we would probably want to do is since we've marked this as 1000 vertices, which I mean, I don't even know how many quads that is. You have to divide it by four. So I guess 250 quads is how many we can draw with 1000 vertices inside our vertex buffer. So 250 quads, you would want enough indices for all of that to be drawable. So typically you'd set up like a for loop that would basically continue generating indices ever ascending in this pattern. So we'll take a look at that in a future video because I really wanna focus on specifically the vertex buffer here. We'll still pretend that we're drawing two quads, even though technically, of course, we can draw a thousand vertices. And then next video, we'll expand the index buffer and all of that to take care of how to actually draw any arbitrary amount of quads, which will be quite exciting. So with that being said, if we recap what we've done, basically what we've done apart from kind of set up a struct here to define our vertex, we've allocated enough memory for 1000 vertices, but the actual vertex buffer is still completely empty, but it's been marked as dynamic draw, meaning that we can actually populate it within our update loop every frame if we need to. So let's do exactly that. I'm gonna come over here and I'm just gonna make some space because this is where we're going to actually set our dynamic vertex buffer. So what I wanna do is bind the buffer the same way that I do it here. And then there are a few different ways to actually do this, but essentially what I want to do is somehow send some data into that vertex buffer. So one of the ways you can do this is by using gel map buffer. What this will do if we actually take a look at it, here is the actual function. What this will actually do is return a void pointer to us of memory that we can actually directly write into. And when we do that and call gl unmap buffer, which is kind of the other side of this function, it will actually upload that buffer to the GPU. So that's one way of doing it. In a lot of cases though, this actually ends up being slightly slower than the method that I'm gonna use. And also the method I'm gonna use has the added advantage of the fact that it's supported in lower versions of OpenGL. And that is gl buffer sub data. So this is extremely similar to gl buffer data, which is what we used here to actually allocate the memory. 
But what it does is basically instead of doing any kind of allocation, it just simply sends that data into that buffer. So what we'll do is type GL array buffer as that first argument, because that's our target. Then we'll have to specify the offset of this data. So since we wanna actually copy this data into the beginning of the buffer, we'll just write zero here because there is no offset. And then we simply need the size of the data we're copying and then a pointer to the actual data. So let's come back over here and we'll steal our vertices. And that's what we'll do. We'll just set these into our buffer. I'll just paste them over here. And then what I'll do is I'll just leave them intact for now. We'll, we'll transition them over to that vertex structure in a minute, but I can still leave them as flow vertices. The memory is identical. So we'll just say size of vertices and then finally vertices. Okay, cool. So what we've done here is effectively dynamically every frame, we're now populating our vertex buffer with this vertex data. And that's it. I mean, you could unbind your buffer, but that's not strictly necessary in this case. This is how we do it. Keep in mind that we're still actually only rendering 12 indices. What we've done here is we've set up our vertex buffer dynamically, but if we come up over here into indices, we are still drawing 12 of these, meaning that, well, 12 is all we have in this case, but we're just going to be drawing index 0, 1, 2, 2, 3, 0 for the first quad and then 4, 5, 6, 6, 7, 4 for that second quad. So no matter what, if I duplicate this data, if I do whatever I want with it, if I add more stuff, it doesn't matter because these first 0 to 7 vertices by index, that's actually what's going to get rendered because our index buffer controls what we render from within this vertex buffer, and this controls how many we actually render. Okay, so if I hit F5 to run my program here, we should get exactly the same result. And you can see we do. Okay, so what's actually changed? Well, this is done every frame now, which means we can control these values. And in fact, let's go ahead and transition them over to use our vertex struct. I'll pull the struct out and I'll just put it at the top of our file here so that the entire file can actually access this. I'll come over here and I'll make some kind of function that returns four vertices for us, which is what we need to actually render a quad. This is just gonna be a really simple example to show how we can actually control this dynamically. So I'll return a standard array of type vertex. And of course we'll have four of these. I'll call this create quad and I'll actually mark it as static. And then let's take in X and Y as arguments, meaning we can actually control the position of this quad. Then what I'll do is simply create the vertices. So I'll have my vertex V0, which is gonna be my first vertex. I'm gonna set the position of that equal to, let's go ahead and just copy this stuff to begin with, because this will take a little bit of time. In fact, what I'm gonna do is just fast forward through this as I copy all of this data and just simply put them into the relevant vertex. Okay, cool, so that looks pretty good to me. And then finally, I can just return v0, v1, v2, and v3 as our array. Okay, so now we have a really simple way of just getting four vertices and then customizing them based on these parameters. So let's actually make that happen. We'll kind of set the size of these to be one, meaning a quad should be a one by one unit quad. And then just for simplicity's sake, we'll assume that the bottom left corner is actually kind of the origin of this quad, meaning this will simply set to be x and y. And now this will be x plus size and just y. This will also be x plus size. And and then now we'll have y plus size. And then over here, we'll just have x and y plus size. Okay, cool. So now we have all of our vertex positions set up. The color we've currently hard coded to be this value, but it doesn't really matter. We're using textures now. So the other thing that I'll do is just simply take in a texture ID here. And this texture ID is what we'll actually put into this attribute over here. So we have a texture ID for all of our vertices. Okay, cool. There we go. We should now be able to use this to draw quads. So what I'll do, I'll call my create quad function and then I'll pass in negative 1.5 and negative 0.5, which is what this used to be, of course, and then a texture ID of zero. So that's great. That's my first quad. And then my second quad is going to be at 0 0.5, negative 0 0.5. So we'll keep the negative 0 0.5 here and we'll just change this to be 0 0.5. Cool. So I've got my two quads now, but obviously I need to actually add them to some kind of buffer of memory that I can then give to this GL buffer sub data function. So what I'll do is keep this real simple. I'll just say auto Q0 for quad zero, auto Q1 for quad one, and then I'll allocate enough storage for both of these quads. So in other words, I know that two quads are gonna be eight vertices. So we'll say vertex vertices eight, and then I'll simply mem copy all of that data here. So I'll say into vertices, I'm going to copy all of Q0 dot data, and that's gonna be Q0 dot size times size of vertex. 
And then I'm gonna do the same thing for Q1, except this is now going to be vertices plus four or vertices plus Q0 dot size if you really don't wanna hard code anything. And now that we've got this, I'm just going to hide all of this data by just commenting it out. And obviously we've called it the same thing. So vertices should in fact be set here. Let's run our program and see what we get. And of course I seem to have forgotten that arrays like this are non-assignable. So what we'll do is just go to our vertex and simply make a struct called vec3 which will be just a three component vector here. And then I'll do the same for vec2 and vec4. Rearrange these. And then we'll simply change this to be a vec3. We'll change this to be a vec4. This will be a vec2. And then we have a float. Obviously in a real example, you'd probably use a math library so you wouldn't be doing any array stuff anyway. Okay, cool. So now hopefully our code will compile. And now that it does, let's take a look at what we get. Okay, cool. So we looks like we have the same result, but they have the same texture. And I guess that would be because we passed the same texture index. So we'll pass a texture index of one into our second quad. And now we should get the exact same result as before. And you can see here it is pretty cool stuff. But here is where it gets cooler and we can really take advantage of this dynamic stuff. What I'm gonna do is add a control to IAM GUI. I'll just write IAM GUI begin controls. And then we'll simply make an IAM GUI control for the actual position of our quad. So we'll say drag float to quad position. We'll pass in a member variable called quad position, which we haven't made yet. And then we'll just write the speed as 0.1. So what I'll do is I'll go over here into our header file. I'll write float m quad position, and we can set it equal to negative 1.5, negative 0.5, which is what it was in the first place. And then what I'll do is I'll actually use this as the position for our first quad here. And now if I hit F5, you can see I have these controls here for this quad. And if I move this, you can see the quad actually moves. And of course this one doesn't because we're just dynamically setting the vertices inside our vertex buffer. So now we can dynamically render our batch. And that's all there is to it. Our vertex buffer is now completely dynamic. Now there is the other part of this, and that is what about the index buffer? How do we set that up? Now that in itself is not all that hard. I want you guys as an X exercise to go ahead and try that out right now. Just try and make that index buffer handle more than just two quads, maybe render three quads or one quad or 10 quads or something like that. You should just be able to extend that index buffer and then change the amount of indices that you actually render inside your glDrawElements function. And that that's all there is to it really. So what we're gonna do in the next video is talk about that specifically. And I'm just going to kind of add some more UI to control all of these things so that we can maybe add and remove quads and do something like that and have a pretty solid batch rendering example that's completely dynamic. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please hit that like button, leave a comment with your thoughts or if anything was unclear and I'll try and get back to you and help you out. Don't forget to check out Skillshare, link in the description below. First 500 people get two months of free Skillshare premium and I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.